You work hard, you can do anything you want in this country. But, you know, that promise, like everything else in Canada today, seems broken. People look around the country and they don't recognize the place. 25% of Canadians now live below the poverty line. Life was not like this before Justin Trudeau, and it won't be like this after he's gone. The problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money, right? He can comb his hair and wear his normal navy blue socks. Merci beaucoup! Who's ready to ax the tax? Who's ready to build the homes? Who's ready to fix the budget? Who's ready to stop the crime? Wow. Who's ready to join Shuv's uh, attempted coup to put my wife in charge of the party? I think a lot of people are. <laughs> Isn't she impressive? Wow. Muchas gracias. Wow, isn't it great to be home? Great to be here in my hometown, almost my home neighborhood, actually. I grew up in uh, Shaughnessy. Uh, born, well, our first place was in Deer Run, then I grew up in Shaughnessy. Anybody here from Shaughnessy? My mother is. She, my mother's actually the mayor of Shaughnessy, Marlene Polyev. And, And some of my best memories are from here, of course. I went to school, Janet Johnstone Elementary School. Went to Wisewood. Everyone went to Wisewood. <laughs> you grew up playing in Fish Creek Park, running my dog, Champ, there. My, some of my best memories are those that I've forgotten because uh, it was underage drinking in the local school park. <laughs> My mother just learned of that now. <laughs> but you know, it's funny. It doesn't matter where you come from in Alberta, because this is a province that is more interested in where you're going. People here... <laughs> ...don't care much who you knew. They, matter, they care more about what you can do. Yeah. And they don't focus on what separates us apart, but on the things we share in common. And you just heard from my incredible wife, though she came from Venezuela, all the things that she shares in common with Albertans, not just the coming from an oil region where they ranch and farm and fight socialism like Albertans do, but also... But also, that Canada made the same promise to her in Montreal when she arrived in the east end of that working, in the working class east end of that city, that it made to me growing up here in Alberta. The promise was very simple. You work hard, you can do anything you want in this country, that anyone from anywhere can do anything. That hard work buys a, gets you a powerful paycheck that buys affordable food, gas, and homes in safe neighborhoods where the sky is literally the limit. And of course, here, there's the biggest sky on earth. But, you know, that promise, like everything else in Canada today, seems broken. In fact, to put it another way, it feels like we're a long way from home. People look around the country and they don't recognize the place. Housing costs have doubled, meaning three-quarters of youth believe they'll never be able to afford a home. No home means no family, means no kids. When they go to the grocery store, they cry at the checkout because they can't afford the price tag. 
We now have 2 million people lined up at food banks. The Food Bank Association says 25 percent of Canadians now live below the poverty line, a record-smashing number. You think it's bad out here? There are now 256 homeless encampments in Toronto, 50 opened in three months alone. Scenes that we would only have imagined in a third world country before Trudeau and the NDP took office and instituted a weird, woke ideology that not only seeks to take our money, punish our work, tax our food, and undermine our entrepreneurs, but also destroys our education, dishonors our history, and divides our people. But the good news is, life was not like this before Justin Trudeau, and it won't be like this after he's gone. You know, I can't entirely keep that promise because he might be gone, be gone before I arrive. There's talk of him heading the road real soon, eh? Do you hear about that by-election in Toronto? People in Toronto voted because he's not worth the cost. They wanted common sense conservatives instead. And ever since, Justin Trudeau has been in panic mode. He's not here at the stampede, is he? Nobody's seen him around. Is anybody missing him? But don't feel offended, Calgary, that Justin Trudeau is hiding from you. He's actually hiding from his own caucus. <laughs> Terrified to meet with the people who are supposed to be his greatest supporters. Soon, you can imagine a caucus meeting of the NDP Liberals in a phone booth with just Jag and Justin. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Oh, Justin's in a lot of trouble now, eh? As Maggie Thatcher said, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money, right? And so now his MPs, who literally didn't care about the fact that their constituents couldn't eat, heat, or house themselves, they got home and they said this election is going to eventually happen whether we like it or not and we're all going to be out of a job and so we need to get ourselves a new leader because everyone is re realizing that while the emperor has many costumes he has no clothes <laughs> And so even the media's got in on the act. Have you seen this? So the first time in Justin Trudeau's career, they've started asking him some tough questions. Now, don't get too excited, because let's be clear, it's not that the media has finally realized that their job is to hold the government accountable to the people rather than the people accountable to the government. It's because they're trying desperately to get someone other than the dud who's leading the Liberal Party to take me on in the next election. But here's the bad news for them. Every other possible leader is just like Justin, right? So what have you got? You've got the finance minister whose idea of deficit... <laughs> whose idea of deficit reduction is cancelling Disney+. Plus. You've got the, the, the squeaky little guy who is responsible for industry, who's handed out our billions of dollars to actually kill jobs. Or you've got the housing minister who caused both an immigration crisis and a housing crisis in under two years. And that's why what they want to do is bring someone in they can claim is completely different because he can comb his hair and wear his normal navy blue socks. So they are now talking about carbon tax carny, right? 
And I understand Carbon Tax Carney has even decided to visit Canada and leave uh, Davos for, for a few weeks <laughs> to, to bring much of the, 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 the brilliance and wisdom from above. He's bu busy, you know, saying that we need to defund Canada's energy sector, all the while he makes, his company makes billions buying pipelines in the Middle East and in Latin America. Carbon Tax Carney is going to jet in and tell Canadians how he's going to spend their money and run their lives. But Carbon Tax Carney is just like Justin. He's just like Justin. They're all just like Justin. And that's why in the next election, the Canadian people are going to choose a real change, a common sense conservative government that will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. Now, as Anna would tell you, the Justin Trudeau's socialist amigos in, Val in uh, Venezuela demonstrated what happens every single time you print money and create cash to fund out-of-control government spending. Every single time it happens, whether it's an emperor, a king, a prime minister, or a president, when their opulence is too big for the nation's wallet. What do they do? They create cash, more money bidding on fewer goods equals higher prices, destroying the purchasing power of the working people. Those closest to government are always the first to touch the new money, the first to profit, and always get richer. The assets of the super rich grow in value while the paychecks and pensions of the working class lose their pay. It is an a, a transfer of wealth from the have-nots to the have-yachts. And that is what has happened here. It's ironic, eh, with these socialists. In the end, when they concentrate the wealth in the hands of government, who ends up benefiting? Those with the most political power, and those are always the most privileged and elite people. It is always the working class that ends up impoverished and lined up at food, food banks. Miss, my friends, the reality is that the foundation of any free market economy, of all prosperity, of all ec real economic justice is sound money. And that's why common sense conservatives will end the money printing. We will get our central bank back to the core mission of low inflation. We'll do that by addressing what is actually the disease. You see, inflation, debt, deficits, and high taxes are only the symptoms. The disease is overspending. Government that is metastasizing and growing faster than the people can afford. Here we have a government that has literally doubled the national debt in nine years. Trudeau's added more debt than all prior prime ministers combined. In fact, to do that, the money supply has grown by $700 billion, or about 35%, in the last four years, during which time the economy, the real economy, grew by about 4%. So we're actually growing the money almost 10 times faster than we're growing the stuff that money buys. It's like if you have 10 apples, and what are you laughing at? Chan, are you okay over there? Shannon Stubbs is cut off, everybody. <laughs> 10 apples and $10. It's a buck an apple. You double the number of dollars to 20, but you still have 10 apples. You're not twice as rich. It's just that each apple costs twice as much. That's why we're going to get rid of the money printing. But how? We need to bring in a common sense law that runs the, the finances of the nation the same way that single moms, small businesses, and seniors run their household finances. We will require the government. By law, find $1 of savings for every new dollar of spending. 
That will allow the economy to grow while the government is capped. We will shrink the regulative size of the government and grow the free, productive economy are all around it. And then also to bring home lower prices, we will do the obvious thing. We will ax the carbon tax. Ax the 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 tax. How do you, how do you like my belt buckle? We're going we're gonna to ax the tax because the foundation of everything we have in this economy, everything we eat, everything we use has to go by truck or train. Everything that comes off the farm field has to be taken using machines powered with diesel and gasoline. The oil and gas industry in this country is not the enemy. And when I'm prime minister, I will champion Canadian energy. Instead of creating more cash, we're going to create more of what cash buys, grow more food, build more homes, and produce more Canadian resources here in this country. We know how to do it. We need to unleash the, the unmatched might of the free enterprise system. We're going to, we'll have fast permits, low taxes, and more competition to drive this economy forward and produce the things that make life materially beneficial to every single person. And that starts by unleashing the production of our resources. A Polyev-led government will pass a common sense law to repeal the unconstitutional anti-resource law C-69. And we will replace it with a law that, yes, protects our environment, yes, consults our first peoples, and yes, gets decisions made. We will approve mines within 18 months rather than 18 years. We'll remove carbon taxes off of the production of the steel that goes into the future pipelines that will again be built in this country. We will, in addition to that, it's not just oil, though we do love Canada's oil sector, we will also unleash the production of more natural gas, LNG. When Trudeau took office, there were 18 proposed natural gas liquefaction projects on his desk. Not one of them has been completed. The only one that's approaching the finish line, LNG Canada, was approved by Stephen Harper in the last year of his government. Give it up for Stephen Harper, by the way. Absolutely. Harper. He looks, you know, people miss him more and more every day. <laughs> but LNG Canada, approved by Stephen Harper, only economically possible because of a carbon tax exemption and because it happened under the pre-C69 approval process, 
We'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions around the world by di displacing dirty coal. This is an incredible project, and now First Nations on both coasts are seeking to do more of it. National Bank just put forward a study demonstrating that if we exported clean Canadian natural gas to India to help provide for half of their future needs on their electrical grid and displacing coal in the process, we would reduce global emissions by 2.5 billion tons, which is three times the total emissions of all of Canada. Wouldn't that be a real solution for the environment? And of course, what does it take to liquefy gas and get it on a ship? Cold weather. What do we have in Canada? Cold weather. In fact, it got so cold in Ottawa last winter, Trudeau was seen with his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> we're going to, but we're going to, when I'm Prime Minister, we're going to give fast permits to LNG liquefaction. We're going to cool that gas to minus 161 degrees Celsius, ship it to Asia to displace dirty Asian coal, ship it to Europe. To, to, to displace the marketplace of the dictator in Moscow. We're going to turn dollars for dictators into paychecks for our people. Bring it home. Bring it home. Bring it home. That's what it means to bring it home. And we need to bring it home because this economy is in free fall. In fact, our GDP per capita is actually smaller than in 2019. We've had this, our economy has gone down in per capita GDP more than any other G7 country in the last five years. Money, jobs, and people are leaving this country like never before. It's like when Ross Perot said there'd be a large sucking sound. Well, that sucking sound is from Canada to the US and around the world, our money our jobs are leaving. Here's the reality. Our economy is about 40% less productive now than the American economy. The average, we produce 53 American dollars per hour worked. South of the border, it's 78 American dollars per hour. Why? We have better workers. We have more resources per capita and more land. We have all the advantages. Why do they produce more? They have more powerful capital. It's very, very simple. The average American worker gets about $28,000 of investment, capital investment per year. The average Canadian worker, 15,000. We get about 55 cents of investment for every dollar our American counterparts get. And we only get 65 cents for every dollar the OECD gets. Why is the capital leaving our country? Well, it wasn't always this way. In the first 25 years of this century, start with the first 14 of those 25 years, the tug of war of American investment in Canada versus Canadian investment in America, we were getting our share and more. In fact, Canada had between $20 billion and $100 billion more American investment in Canada than Canadians invested in the US. We were winning the tug of war for capital against the all-time champions of capitalism. We were beating them until 2014. But since 2015, nearly a half trillion dollars of our money has poured over the border into the United States to open mines and pipelines and factories and business centers and plazas with our money, our money paying American workers. My friends, that is not only economic sadomasochism, it is actually unpatriotic to our people. We're going to bring it home. And now, now Trudeau wants to attack the very entrepreneurs and investors that create those jobs with a 66% tax on our small businesses, our home builders, our farmers, and our doctors. This is insane. Not only do common sense conservatives oppose it, when I'm prime minister, within 60 days, we will create a bring it home tax reform commission that will have a, th a three point mandate. Design me a tax cut that rewards hard work 
investment and making stuff in Canada. Second, that simplifies and cuts the, the administrative and compliance burden by 20 percent. And third, that lowers the share of taxes paid by the working class and does so by cutting taxpayer-funded corporate welfare and cracking down on overseas tax havens. Lower, fairer, simpler taxes to bring it home. But you need a home to bring it to. And our pe young people can't afford homes because we have the fewest homes per capita in the, o in the G7, even though we have by far the most land to build on. Why? The answer is that we have the very worst bureaucracy. Our permits take three times longer than in the States or in the UK. In fact, out of the 35 members of the OECD, we have the second slowest building permits. And what does the federal government do? It shovels tax dollars into the municipal bureaucracies that block home building so that incompetent NDP liberal mayors, like the mayor here in Calgary, can block... <laughs> I say that out loud? <laughs> can block, can block, is she here tonight? I don't think she showed up. She didn't make it out. She, she didn't make it out. They block home building and shut out our next generation. So here's my common sense plan. I'm going to require municipalities free up land cut development taxes, speed up permits to, to build 15% more housing per year as a condition of getting federal funding. If they beat the target, they'll get more money. And they will, if they miss the target, they'll get less money. They will be paid like realtors per home. We're going to start paying for results in this country rather than paying for bureaucracy. We're going to sell off... We'll sell off 6,000 buildings, federal buildings, and thousands of acres of federal land that will no longer be necessary in the national inventory because we will have a smaller federal government. And that land and those buildings will be used for homes. And you know it warms my heart to think of the beautiful family pulling up in their U-Haul to move into their wonderful new home in the former headquarters of the CBC. It's going to be beautiful. I think that's going to be the best day of the whole, the whole time in office will be that day when we defund the CBC, eh? Uh, I think, are they here tonight? Uh, at least someone give them a cold drink. The cameraman's probably a really good guy. But so are the people that will be occupying those, living in those new homes that we're going to unleash. We're also going to cut taxes on home builders, and we're going to ensure that those homes are in safe neighborhoods. Remember when our communities were safe? It wasn't that long ago. But then came Justin Trudeau's radical liberalization of crime and drugs, C-75, which allowed for automatic bail so that criminals are released before the paperwork on their arrest is even completed. And in Vancouver, they had to arrest the same 40 offenders 6,000 times in one year. That's 150 arrests per offender per year. Those that actually get convicted now get house arrest for their career car theft. So you steal, you know, 50 cars, and what do you get? House arrest. You can sit home and watch Netflix or play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> And you know, it's amazing that they're so liberal on crime when they want to ban everything else. They're gonna, they want to ban your plastic straw, but legalize crack in your neighborhood, right? <laughs> as long as you don't smoke the crack through a plastic straw. For God's sakes. <laughs> oh. 
Oh my God. I shouldn't call him wacko, should I? I they're gonna give me a kick down to the All these rules in the House of Commons, you know, I said, where's the funds, WTF? And they thought I was saying something rude. Paul, show them the, the shirt you've got. That's my uncle Paul, check out that shirt. Get one of those at bringithome.ca. Our common sense plan is to repeal catch and release and bring in jail not bail for repeat violent offenders. We're going to we're going to stop giving out taxpayer funded and legalized hard drug and we're going to do what Daniel Smith has done which is to invest in treatment and recovery to bring our loved ones home drug free. Thank you Daniel. Keep up the great work. What a great premier you have here in Alberta. God bless you. You know, and then there's the guns, right? So Justin Trudeau wants to ban Grandpa Joe's hunting rifle, but he only inspects, CBSA inspects 1% of shipping containers that come into this country. No wonder that our cars are being stolen and shipped overseas. So, Here's my common sense plan for that. We're going to have scanners that actually scan what's inside the shipping containers. Right? Can you imagine that? Shocking, eh? So that if the manifest says that inside the shipping containers is some widgets, but the scanner shows that it's a beamer, well, then you take the box, you put it aside, you remove the beamer, you open it up and you look at the VIN, you call the name, the guy who's matched to the VIN, you say, hey, were you planning to send your beamer off to Dubai? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. I just noticed it was missing from my, uh, the front of my house. Okay, great. Well, you can come get it because it's at the port. And we're going to now call the guy who booked the shipping container. We're going to go to his house and say, you're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent, right? <laughs> Pretty simple. And you know how we're going to pay for that? You know we're going to pay for it. We're going we're to forego spending two to seven billion dollars going after law-abiding, licensed, trained, and tested firearms owners. Right now, Trudeau has spent forty million dollars going after your rifles. He wants to ban your rifles. He's, he hasn't been able to collect a single solitary firearm with his $40 million. He actually asked Canada Post if they would go around communities confiscating people's licensed firearms. And fire, uh, Canada Post said, hell no, we're not doing that. <laughs> and get this. Then he did this. This is actually sound, it actually sounds like another one of the, his hallucinations. We have. We have these pest deer on Vancouver Island, apparently on federal land. Have you heard about this? And they need to get rid of these deer. So instead of getting hunters to go and do it for free for the meat, what he's actually done is he's contracted foreign snipers in helicopters to use AR rifles to shoot down at these deer from the sky with the same firearms he wants to ban lost, lawful, li lawful and licensed owners from owning here in Canada. My friends, we're going to end the war on our hunters. We're going to respect licensed, law-abiding, trained and tested firearms owners and go after the real criminals instead. And we're NDP liberal socialists hate hunting because it symbolizes independence and self-reliance. The attack on our freedoms over the last nine years is unprecedented in Canadian history. We've seen it through censorship laws, both C-11 and now C-63, a law that creates a three-headed bureaucracy that can actually put you under house arrest, not for something you've said, but under suspicion of something you might say in the future that would cause harm to someone else's feelings. Meanwhile, we see this woke censorship 
play out on our university campuses. Common sense Conservatives will stand up for the freedom of expression. I will repeal C-11, C-63, and require universities that get federal funding to respect freedom of expression. We will put people back in charge of our country by banning our people, our common people, back in charge of our country by banning any of our ministers or MPs from any involvement in the World Economic Forum. We'll stand up for our Jewish friends and neighbors against anti-Semitism. And we'll recognize that our freedom, while it is rooted in an 800-year-old tradition that started with the Magna Carta and was passed down from one generation to another, depends on a strong national defense. We will. We will cut back on foreign aid that goes to dictators, terrorists, and multinational bureaucracies. We will cut back, we will cut off back office bureaucracy and procurement, incompetence, and corruption, and we will take all of the savings from that to rebuild our military and support the brave men and women who serve in the front lines. What I'm really talking about, my friends, is common sense. I said at the outset that it feels like we're a long way from home. It feels like we've lost hope, and it's easy to forget what home and hope look like. So let me paint the picture of school children, boys and girls, being welcomed by their teacher at the front of the school as they walk in to learn about reading, writing, arithmetic, and our proud history. Thank you, Danielle. Before walking in the door, though, they look back at Dad in his pickup truck who's dropped them off. He rolls down that suburban street with his windows open in the school zone, driving slowly so that he can hear that beautiful crackling sound of hammers pounding nails into Canadian lumber on newly built and affordable Canadian homes. When he gets to the gas station, he fills his tank with affordable and lower taxed Canadian made energy. With his tools in the back, he makes his way out into the countryside where he's going to go and service a well. And he looks out his windows and sees those big, prestigious barley or canola fields, the combines out there doing their work, the cattle grazing on the countryside, producing the best food from the best farmers anywhere on earth. And he looks up. And he looks up, and what does he see? He sees a brand new fighter jet. They're doing a training mission in the sky, getting ready to defend our home and native land. The same plane is soon seen from a university campus where kids are hustling off to class, maybe a bit late, having just procrastinated on that university essay, knowing that when they get to class, they will have the chance to, f to debate freely and fearlessly without worry of being censored. Later in the day, that whole family of the student 
that welder, the kids, moms and dads come together for a big family celebration because it's been 10 years since one of the adult kids in the family has been sober and overcome his drug addiction. And they gather around the table to have a big, beautiful dinner to celebrate. Some wonderful venison that was shot with totally <laughs> legal Canadian firearms is on the table. And so is some big, fat, juicy, barley-fed Alberta beef. <laughs> and they sit and they talk about their beautiful past, but even more so about their optimistic future. And as the little ones conk off and it's time to take them home, Grandma and Grandpa see them off to the car. And the car leaves the driveway and they turn and they look west. And what do they see? They see wheat, foothills, Rockies, and a big blue twilight sky as herald heralded in that beautiful Alberta flag. And they look each other in the eye and they say, we're home. <laughs> These are our people. That is our country. This is our home, your home, my home, our home. Let's bring it home.